Uh, I think I just missed you on the set of uh, Midnight Texas in September. I got there. Yeah, I got there in like the middle of September. They were filming episode seven, I think, and you were, or uh, yeah, seven, and you were in episode six, right? Uh, was it six? I thought I was in seven. No, I'd oh. have to check. <laughs> I just I rewatched it. Uh, I, I think it was six. I just rewatched it like two days ago to make sure. But yeah, I, I must have just missed you. They they flew me out there right in the middle of September. Wow, that's crazy. What were you doing there? Uh, I was doing a set visit for episode eight. I think. I think it was like it was like the second to last episode. So we just took a tour of uh, the sets. Uh, spent most of our time in the cartoon saloon watching uh, everything on the monitor because. They were doing that that big cult scene out in the street, so we couldn't be anywhere near that part of the set. Oh, okay. Wow. That's so, awesome. Yeah, and I, if I had known, I would have uh, I would have tried to get out there earlier. <laughs> so, like every month, there's been a movie that's come in my inbox that has you in it, <laughs> but never oh. any interview opportunities up until like <laughs> just now. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's funny. So, uh, what can you tell me about uh, this new film, the uh, the Sixth Friend? Um, it's a horror film, but also psychological thriller with paranormal elements. So mm-hmm. it crosses a lot of genres. Um, it also um, has a lot of different social themes to it. Have you seen the film? I have not yet. Okay. Okay. Well, you can spoil it for me because in this business, there's really no there's no surprises anymore in films. We they always get spoiled for us. Oh no, I won't spoil it anything for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how'd you get involved with the film? So I wrote the screenplay, um, the original screenplay, and then I met Chantal Albers, who I produced the film with, and then we hired Leisha the director who I'd worked with before. And um, then she wrote the second draft of the script and we bounced it back and forth like nine times total. And um, yeah, that was it. And then we made the movie. Uh, When you're writing, when you're writing a script with someone else or you're taking your original idea and handing it off to someone else, is it kind of a stressful endeavor to try to make sure everything that you want to stay in there is kept in there? Well, it wasn't stressful. Um, I mean, I liked her ideas because um, there was a my original script. There was the film that she said, "Oh, it's like it's a lot like this one," and 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 so I was like, oh, "Okay," and she was right. Um, so then she did some changes that I really liked. So um, no, it wasn't stressful at all. It was a very um, collaborative effort. Uh, when did produ- uh, production start on it? Uh, a few years ago, yeah, we uh, we did a film festival run and took our time doing that. And we took our time, too, with getting distribution. Like, we got many offers, but we turned them all down. But when the Asylum offered, I've known the Asylum since 2010. I've known them personally. I've done three other movies. So, mm-hmm. and, you know, it's a good offer. And, and I know they do great work getting the films out. And so we just waited for the, the right the right distribution company. Uh, When it comes to the asylum, it seems that their reputation has really changed since back when I started writing back in like the early 2000s or mid 2000s. Have have they really upped their game and trying to be more of the the filmmaker sort of distributor? Yeah, I mean, definitely they're, I mean, my goodness, they're working with Netflix now on uh, series black summer Netflix series so they've definitely upped their game um, for sure they're they're an intelligent business (laughs) they're they're good they're really good at what they do Uh, do you have any other projects coming up with Asylum Uh, not right now no how did how did you get started in the business when I was going through your uh, IMDB uh, last week I was like wow you you have so many credits and where, how did it all start? Where did, what was your reason for getting into this industry? Well, I think I wanted to act since I was a child because I was watching movies and acting them out. Um, yeah. When I was probably, like, I was really young. So 
I was obsessed with A Nightmare on Elm Street, that particular film, and I would act like Nancy, and I would act out all the scenes and make my friend come over, and she would be Tina, and I would be Nancy, and <laughs> we would do the scenes. I was like nine years old. So, see, I just, it was always in me. It's just my purpose in life, and it was just me at the moment when I recognized that it was my purpose and, and actually followed the dream. I almost did, and I almost stayed in Illinois, and I was about to get engaged. Um, someone I really loved and we're still friends, you know? Um, so it was like, okay, do I want to stay in this town, get married, have kids? And we know the rest. And, and I don't know, I didn't like the way that was sitting with me. I was feeling doom and gloom. And so I was like, something's wrong. So, so Illinois is not the hot place to stay and, and do your thing. That's what you're saying. No, it's funny, actually, um, at the time that I left Illinois, there was something like, something ridiculous. It was between like 40 and 70 TV shows filming in Chicago. So I did not know that because everyone thinks L.A. is the place to go to, mm-hmm. to get into film and television. But actually, if I had stayed in Chicago – or south of there where I'm from, I probably would have done better because <laughs> it's a smaller market. You go mm-hmm. to a smaller city, it's a smaller market. Everyone runs out to L.A. to act. So if I would have hit the smaller market first and hit and gotten TV into TV and stuff, I think it would have been better, but I didn't know that. I just did what everyone thinks you do, and you run out to L.A., oh, when, when you went out to L.A., what was, what was it like trying to break into the business? Um, you know, there's a lot of rejection and, um, yeah, I mean, I didn't know anyone and so you're raw submitting to agents and it's tricky. I did get a decent agent pretty quickly, um, but I don't know that I was ready for that at the time. Like I look back and I look at how my craft has developed over the years and, you know, I don't know that early on that I was ready um, to to compete at at that level. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, I went to some auditions and then I don't know, it kind of fizzled out. The agent didn't send me out, and then it was a it was then I was getting into independent film and doing some acting classes and um and I don't know. Eventually, things just started to snowball. And uh, certain projects helped me out a lot, I think, along the way. It was an accumulative um, thing rather than one that really, like, that was that was it when I really started working. But, yeah, I started working, I think, pretty consistently. Um, I know 2015 was a really good year. Um, it but seems yeah, like you have back-to-back like stuff, like, right now, it seems – like almost everything is just like 2017, 2018, over and over and over again. This your past few, like your past ten credits, or it seems like you were just really busy. Yeah, well, I'm attached to like 19 films right now. Um, so 19 films, like that you see on my IMDb, or actually, I think it's 16 now. Um, we, I don't know when those will be made. You know, mm-hmm. so they've attached my name. I've noticed since I spit on your grave, I think um, since I booked that, and I think films, they like to attach my name to try to get the funding and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I have all these films trying to get the funding right now that I'm attached to. Um, so we'll just see what, what shoots this year. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what what's your advice for uh, those up and coming filmmakers that are looking to either make the move to LA or Chicago or even Atlanta? Hmm. I mean, I would say persistence is huge, um, and you have to be prepared to work really hard. You know, people, I don't know, they think we come out, we do one little audition, and we get the part. No, we're working all the time. We're working on updating our headshots, updating our acting demo tapes, um, 
promoting on social media is huge. Um, it's constant, constantly working, constantly submitting for projects or talking to your agent, making plans. I mean, you have to really be prepared to work really, really hard. This isn't a mm-hmm. nine to five job that ends on Friday at 5 p.m. Not at all. <laughs> yeah, I was a, I was a failed actor, so I know, I know it's the rejection is a really hard thing. You can have one good thing like I had, and then you can just have nothing. It just, it just dries up. And then I, I was, I, I don't know, I don't want to say I was smart enough to just get out when I realized it wasn't the thing to do, but sometimes you just, sometimes it's not for everybody. It's, it's hard. It's very difficult. So I applaud anyone that can do it and do it long term. Yeah, absolutely. I think you find out really quickly if it's for you or not, you know, like I had someone state to me some months ago who I met and she's like, yeah, I just came here from Atlanta and then, you know, I'm going to give it two years. And if I haven't made it by then, then that's it. And I'm thinking, Oh, Oh no, honey. (laughs) I mean, yeah, maybe you can make it in two years, like on a top TV show or something, but I have literally never seen that ever. And I've been doing this 12 years. I've seen someone do it in six years, but Mm -hmm. That isn't to say that it couldn't happen. Anything is freaking possible, you know. So I always say that, too. But just the fact that she put a time limit on it, I was kind of like, I don't know that this is her purpose in life. Because for me, there is no time limit. There is no plan B. There is no thought about doing anything else. You know, there just isn't Mm -hmm. that thought. I think you look at people like Millie Bobby Brown and they see how she suddenly blew up from being relatively unknown, but she had been in the business for, I think, since she was like five or six. So you can't just judge it on one person's performance. It's just not going to happen for everybody. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, When it comes to uh, the six friend uh, circle around back to that, when will uh, people be able to watch that and where can they find it? Well, right now it's in theaters. There's 10 cities across the United States. And um, on my Instagram, my last post, the trailer, I listed the cities. Um, Do you want me to go through those or – uh, actually, I do have the list, so when I put the story up with uh, with the interview, I'll I'll make it uh, at the top of the story. Okay, I hope it's you. It's not Austin now; it's Houston. They switched okay. that out. It's Houston at the Fin C I N E America Houston. Okay. So yeah, I need to let Clint know that. <laughs> yeah, because they've been sending out the same one since as of two days ago. Okay. Yeah. Uh oh, I better let them know they changed that. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I'll make sure it's it's updated on our story. Um, and uh, to uh, oh my god, I'm sorry. Saturdays, it's really <laughs> not on top of my game on the weekends. Um, no worries. When it came to um, Midnight Texas, uh, what was your experience like on that show? Oh, so much fun. Um, Parisa, one of the lead actresses, she's, um, so sweet. Like when you're a guest star on a TV show, it's like you're walking into a family and you're like the stranger, you're the stranger at dinner, you know, (laughs) family dinner. And so fitting in can be tricky. It can be awkward. And man, she just, she plays the witch on the show, like, she, wow, she made me feel so comfortable. She went out of her way to make sure I knew where I was going or see if I needed help, that I was comfortable. And then she included me in the live tweeting um, when the show aired, like made sure I had the login information. Like, I mean, who does that? I mean, she is just so so lovely. So she made the experience incredible. And then, yeah, the rest of the crew was like super chill. It was like one of those shows that I was on where I was like, I would love to be a series regular on this. Like it would be comfortable and safe and friendly and nice, you know, like a great place to go all the time and work and be awesome. That was the experience I had when I was on set too. Everything was really laid back uh, it wasn't really uptight like a lot of like 
uh, some Netflix shows I've been on where everything's really just like compact and they try to like wrangle you in. They don't let you go and talk to the crew or anything, but it was just, it was super nice. And then I got to sit with uh, Parisa as well. And then uh, Dylan Bruce came down and they sat together and talked to us, which was nice to see them bounce off of each other and see that they, they do actually have that chemistry off the camera that made it so believable in the series, which is really nice. Oh uh, yeah. It's just too That's bad. Cool. It got canceled. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> yeah, that, Dylan's great. Yeah, man, that, that's that a bummer. Move, I know. I <laughs> that move to a different time slot. Just I, I could tell right when they did that, that was just going to be a bad sign, which is really unfortunate because it's one of the few paranormal shows we really have right now on TV. Mhm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that was that's a good. <laughs> yeah, I know. I wanted to go back on the show too. You know, sometimes I'll bring back guest stars. Like, mm-hmm. and now I'm like, yeah, that ain't gonna happen now. <laughs> yeah, and, and your character was left alive at the end of it, so there could have been, or uh, I'm trying to think, did they recast, or did they use some of the same guest stars in different parts in season two? I'm not sure, because um, I I hadn't watched season two because I was in South Africa working. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I hadn't watched it um, when I came back yet. So, haven't well, tell seen us, it. I don't know. Tell us some about this uh, the South Africa trip you've got going on there. What was what was that for? It was for a film called Hear No Evil. It's the same company, same director, Daryl Root, I worked with earlier in the year on a, a film called The Furnace. Um, Daryl's fantastic. He's an Oscar-nominated director. The movie I saw, cut of the movie, it's, oh my gosh, it's a tearjerker. <laughs> so it's a faith-based drama. So I did that with them, and then their next film, Hear No Evil, they cast me as the lead again. I'm so grateful for. So I, they flew me out, and we did a bunch of pre-production stuff, and um, like photo shoots and interviews and script read throughs and all kinds of stuff so it ended up being like a work slash vacation (laughs) and then I went to Cape Town you know after all the work was done and had a blast um so yeah I love South Africa I love the people I love the culture I love the food the wine is amazing (laughs) So for all the for all the strife that that the entertainment industry puts you through, there's there's some there's some good stuff that comes to it that's oh, off hours. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, like I, man, sometimes I mean I you have to take those moments and be grateful and look at what you have and you know so often we want to go, but I want this, I want that, and you know, why haven't I gotten this yet? And I think it's so important to take those moments to reflect back and be thankful for what you have. I'm always thankful when I get to go film a movie in some amazing location and get to travel there and they pay all my expenses. And then I, I'll always try to take a vacation after the filming in the area. And because I'm there already, I might as well, you know, see the sites and I'm into photography too so I do that and just yeah the the opportunities that I've gotten are just incredible I'm so thankful it's like if I worked a nine to five job it's you know you don't get to do this stuff oh yeah trust me I know it it sucks <laughs> yeah yeah I've done it too I've worked a nine to five it's, if if yeah. I could just write and and travel for writing just and and make a living, it would be great. I would do nothing but that. But unfortunately, it just doesn't happen for genre writers. <laughs> oh, yeah, I hear ya. <laughs> so, all right, Jamie. Uh, to wrap this up, uh, where can uh, where can people reach you on social media? Um, I'm on Instagram. I'm very active on there under Jamie Bernadette, spelled just like my name. It's a verified account, so they'll know they have the right one. On Twitter, I'm Jamie Bernadette without the E on the end of my name, but it's also verified account, so they'll know they have the right account. And then on Facebook, um, I do have a fan page that I do, like a page. And then I have a personal page, which isn't personal, really. Everything is public on there, and you can follow me. I have my follow button turned on. It's Jamie Bernadette. 